You deserved it, though, Miss Worth, after having talking people into coming and throwing balloons at me and squirting a water gun at me. Uh, once again, I'd like to tell you, Miss Worth, uh, she goes to get her CDL or her license renewed. They will most certainly not renew the CDL portion of the license, and we will need uh, someone with a CDL license and a passenger endorsement that would be willing to drive that bus. Now, I'm not going to lie to you and say, hey, it's the most fun thing you'll ever do. It is a, a tough ministry to be a part of. It takes dedication, um, but we need some drivers. We need some drivers. Amen, Brother Jesse? Amen. Amen, Brother Patrick? Amen. No pressure. <laughs> he already has CDL. He just needs a passenger endorsement. Hey, we can, hey, yeah. Bring it to the office. We'll, we'll put a P on there. 1 Samuel chapter 7. Let's look at verses 1 through 6. How many of you love Jesus? Say amen. Hey, how many of you love Jesus? Raise your hand and are willing to get a CDL license. Okay, good. And the men of, men of Kirjath Jerim came and fetched up the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab in the hill and sanctified Eleazar to keep the ark, or his son to keep the ark of the Lord. It came to pass while the ark abode in Kirjath Jerim that the time was long, for it was 20 years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. So here's what had happened. Prior to this, the children of Israel uh, had lost the ark. They had fallen out of favor with God. They had, had been living this uh, uh, duplicitous lifestyle. They, would, they were worshiping God, but they were also worshiping Baal. They were also worshiping Ashtoreth and these other false gods. And in battle... Uh, the high priest, his sons were killed. When he caught news of it, he fell back, broke his neck, he died. The ark was taken away. Now the Philistines, because they opened the ark, which is something you were not to do, God smote them with some plagues, and they sent it back to the children of Israel. Now it is at this man's house, but it is still not back where it belonged in Jerusalem. So for 20 years, now verse 3 says, And Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, if ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and Ashtoreth from among you. I'll follow this statement here. And prepare your hearts unto the Lord and serve him only. He will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. Then the children of Israel did put away Balaam and Ashtoreth and served the Lord only. And Samuel said, Gather all Israel to Mizpah, and I will pray for you unto the Lord. And they gathered together to Mizpah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day and, sa and said there, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel in Mizpah. Now turn over, if you would, to Psalm 78. Psalm 78. Psalm 78. In this passage, the children of Israel were told that they were to te teach their children the Lord's commandments and they were to teach their children of the mighty works that they had seen their God do so that their children would know their God rather than rebel against God like their forefathers had done. And we see this here in Psalm 78 verses 5 through 8, for he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel which he commanded our fathers that they should make, him, make them known unto their children, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God but keep his commandments, and, not, and might not be as their fathers a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their heart aright, and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. So we see in the first passage we read, Samuel telling the people, listen, prepare your hearts after the Lord. We see here that the children of Israel that had rebelled against, that generation that rebelled against God, had not set their heart right with God, and their spirit was not steadfast with God. Now I'll turn over to Psalm um, tell you just uh, just a little ways away, Psalm seventy-eight. <laughs> Psalm, 
verse 29. There's different verses. I just want to see the look on Shamit's face. Uh, verse 29 through 37. So they did eat. Now here we see a recounting of the works of God. So they did eat and were filled. For he gave them their own desire. They were not estranged from their lust. So the things that Israel wanted for themselves, God, even though that was not what God had planned for them, he said, okay, that's what you want, you got it. Let me tell you something. God sometimes will give you what you want. And once you get it, you'll wish you never had it. <clears throat> they were not estranged from their lust, but while their meat was yet in their mouths, the wrath of God came upon them and slew the fattest of them and smote down the chosen men of Israel. For all of this they sinned still and believed not for his wondrous works. Therefore their days did he consume in vanity and their years in trouble. When he slew them, then they sought him. And they returned and inquired early after God. And they remembered that God was their rock and the high God their redeemer. Nevertheless, they did flatter him with their mouth. And they lied unto him with their tongue. But their heart was not right with him, neither were they steadfast in his covenant. You read that chapter, you see a recounting of the works of God, how he brought them out of Egypt, the splitting of the Red Sea, how he fed them with manna, how he fed them with quail, how he brought water out of a rock. And even after these mighty displays of God's power, the children of Israel complained in their discontent. and They sought the desires of their own lust and their own heart. So God brought judgment. When he brought the judgment, they, the Bible says they sought after God, but we learn that it was a, a false seeking, a false repentance. They were just seeking for relief. They were, it's almost like the, the child, how many of you remember uh, maybe mom or dad grabbing you by the arm and, and whooping you in a circle? Anybody ever had that happen? My mom, she would chase me with her hand, and we'd be running in a circle. And I knew... Though it didn't hurt once I got bigger than she did, and she just wearing me out with her hand, that didn't hurt. But I knew if I acted like it didn't hurt or let her know that it didn't hurt, she would let Dad know. And Dad was not going to use his hand and chase me around in a circle. It, it, he was going to make me feel something. And so I did sort of like Israel. Oh, Mama, oh, Mama, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I acted like it hurt. And I'd bring a tear to my eye, and I'd walk away and say, well, I hope she don't tell Dad. Didn't change anything. Maybe I wasn't even sorry for what I had done. And Israel, when God brought judgment, the Bible said they, they said, oh, you know what, wait, wait, wait a minute. God, okay, okay, we realize we've done wrong here. You're our God. You're our rock. But they were just seeking relief. They weren't seeking their God. Look, that last part says, For nevertheless, I'm sorry, verse 35, And they remembered that God was their rock and the high God their redeemer. Nevertheless, they did flatter him with their mouth. Oh, God, you're our rock, you're our redeemer, you're our, our, our wonderful God. And they lied unto him with their tongue, for their heart was not right with him, neither were they steadfast in his covenant. They weren't wanting to be right with God they were just seeking for relief. Everybody follow me. In these several passages we read here, we see terms like um, prepare your heart. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Prepare your heart. We see how that their heart was not right with God. They would go through the motions. They would offer the sacrifices. They would uh, uh, flatter him. That means they just brag on their God and but they lied unto him, hey, you know what, we're going to serve you. I remember watching a movie on TV years ago. It was a Burt Reynolds movie. I'm dating myself now, right, an old movie. And uh, he had been put in a, a, like what they would call the crazy house. And uh, he was with a bunch of people, and somehow he escaped, and he decided he was just going to kill himself. And so he started swimming way out into the ocean. And when he got out there and he was about to drown, he realized, I'm not, I don't want to die. 
I want to live. So he started swimming back, and as he was swimming back towards shore, he began to pray, God, if you'll let me get back alive, I'll give you 10% of everything I have. And he's swimming, and now he's becoming more desperate, and he's still far away from shore. And he said, God, if, if you'll get me back to shore, I'll give you 20% of everything I have. And he'd get a little closer, and he got all the way up to 50%. And, and he's praying, God, if you'll just let me live, I'll give you 50% of everything I have. And he makes it back to the beach, and he's on his hands and his knees. He's, oh, oh, thank you, God. I haven't forgot that 10% I said I was going to give you. flattering with his mouth, lying with his lips. He was just seeking relief. He wasn't seeking God. What does the preparation of the heart include? What does that look like? How do you prepare your heart? And I see a couple of things in common throughout uh, uh, the Bible when it comes to this theme right here. Number one, to prepare your heart involves humility. Humility. Listen to this right here by G.K. Chesterton. He wrote this in 1908. Listen to what he said. What we suffer uh, from today is humility in the wrong place. Modesty has moved from the organ of ambition. Modesty or humility has settled <coughs> upon the organ of conviction where it was never meant to be. A man was meant to be doubtful about himself, but undoubting about the truth. This has been exactly reversed. Nowadays, the part of a man that a man does assert is exactly the part that he ought not to assert himself. The part he doubts is exactly the part he ought not to doubt, the divine reason. The new skeptic is so humble that he doubts if he can even learn. There is a real humility typical of our time. But it so happens that it's practically a more poisonous humility than the wildest prostrations of the ascetic. The old humility made a man doubtful about his efforts, which might make him work harder. But the new humility makes a man doubtful about his aims, which makes him stop working altogether. We are on the road to producing a, a race of man too mentally modest to believe in the multiplication table. Here's what he was saying. The, the old humility, what it did is it made a man doubt himself. But he was sure of divine reason. He was sure of truth. He knew, hey, two times two is four. Two times three is six. Two times four is eight. He said, but now it has shifted to where man believes in himself while doubting truth. Humility. What is humility? What does that even involve? I have five things here. Number one, it's a sense of being subordinate to God in Christ. Matthew 10, 24, the disciple, Jesus said, The disciple is not above his Lord, above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. 1 Peter 5, 6 says this, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Listen. If I want to prepare my heart for prayer, listen, I, I, when I pray, is it not true that I'm coming into the presence of God? Is that true? <clears throat> when I pray, God has given me that invitation, that permission, that ability to actually enter into His presence. Now think about that for just a minute. Entering into the presence of a holy God. If right now the heavens could open and we had a pathway and we could walk into the physical presence of God, I wonder if we would go into His presence, that physical presence where we could see the glory of God and the brightness of His glory. And the, we hear the angels singing and the, the four and twenty elders there falling down, throwing their crowns at His feet. And we hear, holy, holy, holy. I wonder if we would approach Him there like we approach Him here. I wonder if we would sh swagger into His presence. Sup? Yo, yo. 
Well, preacher, we would never do that. Well, there's no way we would go into God's physical presence that flippantly, that arrogantly. And yet, do we not do that when we praise Him? Not that we, I think some parts of it, it's just a, an apathy, just a, a ritual to us. But when we pray, when we enter God's presence, we are coming into the presence of a holy God that spoke the universe into existence, who measured the waters with his hands, who put the stars and the planets and everything in their orbit, and, and all things consist by him. He holds it all together. The one who breathed into Adam the breath of life, and he became a living soul. This all-powerful, all-wise, all-knowing God. And sometimes, now we can approach him like a father. We can approach him like a friend. Yet there ought to be that sense of, this is God I'm talking to. Humility. That sense of, I'm subordinate. He is my king. He is my master. He is my God. Humility does not feel that it has a right to be treated any better than Jesus Christ was treated. Matthew 10, 25. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call him of his house, them of his household? In 1 Peter 2, 21 through 23. For even hereunto were ye called... Because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. Here's what he's saying. Jesus Christ came. He was mistreated. He was falsely accused. He was lied about. Though he did no sin, there was no sin found in him. He knew not sin, the Bible said, yet he died as a sinner. He took our sin upon him. He was humiliated. He humbled himself. He didn't say, wait, wait, wait. Don't you know who I am? I'm the Son of God. I'm the King of kings, the Lord of lords. I, I, this is not right for me to be treated this way. No, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Humility does not feel that it has a right to be treated any better than Jesus was treated. Humility is not marked by vengeance. It is not marked by returning evil for evil. Humility is not demonstrated in a life based on perceived rights. Well, this is not right. I have a right to be treated better than this. Oh, really? have no more right than Jesus Christ had. I'm subservient to him. The third thing, humility does not debate truth for the purpose of inflating the ego by winning debates. It asserts truth out of a love for Christ and for others. 1 Corinthians 3, 13, 6, rejoice not in iniquity, but rejoice in the truth. 2 Corinthians 4, 5, for we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves your servants for his sake. Sometimes we study the word of God and we learn something and all of a sudden uh, we know, hey, boy, I've got something here from the word of God and everybody that does not have this yet, they're probably nowhere near as right with God as I am. Now, if we know any truth at all, it's by the grace of God who revealed that truth to us. If we have anything at all, it came from God, am I right? Humility. Sometimes, like the kings of the Old Testament, who would say, look, and Nebuchadnezzar, I think it was, look at all that my hand. Look how wealthy my kingdom is. Look how I have everything I want. I don't even need God. And 
Sometimes we have this, I look, look at this, this business I'm building, look at this family I have, look at my home and, and look at uh, uh, my, uh, all these things that I have. Look at all these things I've done, God. God, you ought to be proud to have me on your team. Man, we ought to humble ourselves. That's part of preparing the heart. There's no room for pride at all. Entering the presence of a holy God. Here's the next thing, humility. It realizes that it is dependent on the grace of God, even for what it knows and believes. I touched on this just a little. 1 Corinthians 4, 7. For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now, if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? Oh, you don't understand. Uh, I'm, I'm very successful because I am a hard worker. Well, wait a minute. Who gave you the health to be able to do that? Who gave you the mind to be able to do that? Who allowed you to be born in this country where you could do that? Who allowed you to be born in the family you was born into? God, James 1.21 Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. He said even in receiving the truth of God's word, we're to receive it humbly. The, the Israelites, they did the exact opposite the Jews did. They received what they called the oracles of God, God's word. They received it. They became very puffed up and proud. Look at us. We have the, the word of God. We are God's chosen ones. And the rest of you, you're just a bunch of plebes. You're, you're just a, a, a bunch of nothings. Even those of Gentiles who would convert to Judaism, they were considered a second-class citizen because they were not blood Jews. And the Jews became very puffed up and haughty in their truth rather than saying, wow, of all the nations in the world, God chose us for no good reason. It's just his pleasure. He chose us to give us his word. God, not worthy. Even what we know and believe is dependent on the grace of God. Here's the next thing. Humility realizes its frailty and fallibility. Therefore, it considers criticism and learns from it. Humility realizes I'm still just flesh. I can still be wrong. Even if I've studied something and I've looked at it, and I, I still, I may not have gotten exactly right in, in 1 Corinthians 13, 12. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part. Paul's saying that now I only know part of the picture. But then shall I know even as also I am known. Proverbs 12, 15. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes. He that hearkeneth to counsel is wise. Humility is we realize that we are, are, are full of frailties and faults and we will receive criticism, measure it, and consider it and make corrections where those corrections need to be made. Prepare your heart, he said. wonder how often we prepare our heart before we go to the Lord in prayer. I wonder if sometimes we pray and it feels like it's just bouncing off the ceiling and we pray and, and it really it just does nothing for us. We feel like, oh, that was just a vain exercise. I wonder if it's because we just swaggered into the throne room. Hey, God, here I am. Be grateful. Here I am. I'm coming to you. Hey, it's me. Your favorite kid. It's me, the one that does so good that doesn't cause you a lot of headaches. You know, me, I don't come to you and pray often because I really don't need to and I don't want to bother you. I wonder how many of us realize before we go to pray, we prepare our hearts and we think about who God is, this one that we are about to approach. And in seeing him, look, when, when Isaiah saw God in his glory, he heard the voice of God. He said, woe is me. I'm a sinner. 
I'm in the midst of a sinful people. People, when they had come into the presence of God, they would hide their face. I'm not even worthy to look at him. If I look at him, I'll die. Do we prepare our hearts before we go to him in prayer? Do we prepare our hearts before we read his word? I wonder if maybe one of the reasons we read his word and it, and we say, well, you know, it's just the same old, same old. It's kind of dry. I didn't really get anything out of it. God didn't speak to me. Is it because we didn't go to him with a heart that was prepared to hear what he had to say? Did we go to him with a heart that was prepared for him to rebuke us if we needed to be rebuked? Did we go to him with a heart uh, uh, prepared for correction if we needed to be corrected? I wonder how many times we go to church and it really does nothing for us because maybe we didn't prepare our hearts beforehand. And I'm going to go listen. I'm a fallible person going to listen to another fallible person preach the infallible word of God. Boy, who am I to be worthy of that? Humility was always present in the preparation of the heart. Humility. And when they were not humble, we saw that with the children of Israel, that they turned out and said they flattered him and they lied to him, but their heart was not right. There was no humility there. They were just seeking relief. There was no recognition of, you are a holy God and I am a sinner totally dependent upon your grace. There's a second thing that seemed to be in common with the preparation of the heart, and that was sanctification dedication we could call it first peter 315 <clears throat> but sanctify the lord god in your heart hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear sanctify the lord god in your heart set him apart first samuel 7 3 and Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, If you do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the str strange gods and Ashtoreth from among you, and prepare your hearts unto the Lord, and serve him only. Sanctify him. Set him apart. He said, Look, put away all, put away Baal, put away Ashtoreth, put away everything else, and serve God and God only. Let him be number one in your life. Let him be the central figure in your life. Listen, our purpose as followers of Christ, and if I want my heart to be prepared for him, my purpose is to be wrapped up in Jesus Christ. He's to be central in our life. He is to be our chief goal. He is to be our chief aim above our personal desires above our perceived rights, right church? Above our personal pleasures. Philippians 3, 8 through 10. Listen to Paul. Now listen, tell me if you see humility and dedication here. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, he made conformable unto his death. Paul said, all those things that were important to me, I've lost them all. I've suffered them as lost. I count them as dung. Why? I just want to know him. I want to stand in front of him, not clothed in my own righteousness, which is of the law. Paul had been a, 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 a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He kept the law. 
He said, that was my own righteousness. I don't want you to stand in front of him in that righteousness. I want to stand in front of him in that righteousness that only comes by faith in him and through his grace. Here's a question for you. A couple questions. Ask yourself this. Is my heart prepared for him? Let's see that. You know, we're, we're going to start, uh, or this coming Wednesday night, I mentioned it last Wednesday night, we're going to uh, change the format of the service, and we're going to have prayer meeting. One of the great disciplines of our faith, praying, being able to talk to God, come into his presence, and it's one of the most neglected things in the Christian life. We're going to meet, we'll have a little devotional, we'll sing a song, then we're going to split up uh, into a couple of manageable groups, and we're going to pray. And it won't be 20 minutes of, of prayer requests and two minutes of prayer. We're, we're going to pray with each other. We're going to pray for each other. Man, we're going to, we're going to uh, together corporately, like we see done in the New Testament, we're going to approach God. We're, we're going to ask God, God, would you, would you use us? Would, would you do something with us and through us? We, we make ourselves available to you. But will we prepare our hearts first? Will we come in flippantly, boy, hey, God, we're going to have a prayer meeting. You ought to be proud of us. God, we're... This group of sinners saved only by your grace are going to get together. Thank you that you've made it possible that I can come into your presence with my brothers and sisters and know your grace. Will we humble ourselves? Will we set God apart in our life as, God, you are my chief aim, you're my chief goal, I want to be wrapped up in you. Are our hearts prepared to meet God in our quiet time? Or is our quiet time something that is rushed and forced? Our hearts prepared to meet, meet with God in a manner that will give us reviving. You know what David said, restoring to me the joy of thy salvation. His heart was prepared. He was humbling himself. He was setting apart, uh, God apart in his life. Our hearts prepared to meet with God in a manner that we can obtain the power we need to serve him and fulfill the mission he's left for us. Will our hearts be prepared to hear him when he speaks to us? Through the preaching of his word, through the reading of his word, through the memorization of his word, will our hearts be prepared to even hear him when he speaks with that still, small voice? Pride is very loud. God's voice is a still, small voice. If our hearts are not prepared, our own pride will keep us from hearing God as he speaks to us. I want to encourage you tonight, folks. As we are seeking God, make sure we don't skip this pre-seeking, this, this warm-up, you could almost call it in today's vernacular, of preparing To meet with him and to hear him and to be changed. Everybody, hand, close your eyes, please.